بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعد أما بعد uh, Brothers and sisters, it's been a while since I've done a library chat and inshallah as you're aware I'm trying to spice it up, do different things uh, some of them involve conversations with other people and uh, subhanAllah just so happened that I was speaking with uh, two uh, friends of mine one of whom I met many times, the other one I've only corresponded with but there's definitely a strong friendship uh, between us we're talking about the same topics and I thought subhanAllah it would make so much sense if the three of us can just have a frank dialogue and engage in a very, very uh, sensitive topic. And so that's exactly what we're going to be uh, doing today. Inshallah ta'ala, we're going to be talking about uh, a topic that really is so many of us uh, in the Muslim world, in the uh, in the activist field, uh, we are debating and talking amongst ourselves. And that is really the reality uh, of establishing in a type of Islamic uh, political system. How feasible is it? How realistic is it? Is it something that is a part and parcel of our tradition? If so, uh, is it theological or is it fiqhi based? And if so, is it tawqifi? Is the methodology to do so enshrined in the sharia or is it ijtihadi? And if so, what level of priority you know, does such a uh, a reality have. So these are very, very uh, deep topics. And uh, joining me today, I have two very uh, esteemed uh, guests. Uh, first, we have uh, Imam Tom uh, Fakini, who converted to Islam in 2010, a year before he finished his Bachelor's of Arts in Political Science from Vassar College. Uh, then he went on to study at uh, Jam Islamiyah in Medina, where I met him a number of times, uh, I think for pizza, if I'm not mistaken, and also for burgers. But yes, Alhamdulillah, we met a number of times when I used to visit. He was studying over there, and he obtained his BA from uh, Kulit al-Sharia. And he then returned to America, and he's currently uh, the research, research director of Islam and Society at the Yaqeen Institute here in Dallas. And he's also the resident scholar of uh, Utica. Is that pr pronunciation Utica or Utica? How is it pronounced? Utica. 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 Okay. Utica. I should know this. Utica yeah. Masjid in New York. And he also teaches Tafsir and Islamic history online through Legacy International Online Islam High School. And of course, uh, Imam Tom has already carved out. Uh, a niche for himself online by talking about topics that you rarely hear being discussed by graduates of Islamic studies, and that is political science, secularism, European uh, uh, colonialism, and uh, political theory. And so that's why I was talking with him back and forth, and I said, let's have a conversation. He said, inshallah, for sure. That will be our first guest, Imam Tom. Welcome. Barakallah fikum. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Alhamdulillah. And we also have with us Ustad Uthman Badr who is the, uh, joining us all the way from down under Australia, Sydney, Australia. Uh, and he is the editor and research um, operations manager at Ummatics uh, Institute and a longtime student of Arabic and Islamic studies and continental philosophy. And he deserves a Mubarak, a, a welcome, a special welcome from us because he has just finished a PhD in philosophy uh, from Western Sydney University. And the topic was a critique of the conception of secularity and the legitimation of secularism in liberal political thought. And of course, uh, Ustad Uthman Badr uh, is very well known online. And that's how I got to know him by reading his post. Very deep, very analytical, very fair, very balanced. I actually reached out to him. Uh, I contacted a number of friends of mine. I said, I need to get in touch with this person. I think that was three years ago, if uh, Sheikh Uthman, I forgot. Um, and we started corresponding, you know, back and forth. And Alhamdulillah, it's just been uh, wonderful. And again, these are some of the similar topics we've been discussing. So uh, I haven't yet physically met him because we're so far apart. But inshallah, my next trip to Australia, we're definitely going to make some time. But uh, Ustad Uthman, Welcome, Alhamdulillah. Inshallah. Jazakallah khairan. It's a pleasure to be here. Alhamdulillah. So the way we decided we're going to discuss this, this is a very organic discussion. Uh, inshallah, we're all going to begin um, by uh, summarizing some of the thoughts we have. And uh, forgive us if they're not really uh, very well thought out, because these are, I mean, at least from my side, these are uh, more um, generic thoughts than, you know, uh, a actual lecture I'm giving. Uh, but um, so we're all going to start off by 10 max, you know, 15 minutes or so. We summarize what our viewpoint is about uh, political engagement about the establishment of a Islamic political system uh, and pros and cons and how we view it. 
And then after the three of us are done, inshallah, we will then have a organic conversation. Brothers and sisters, this is not scripted at all because I really want to engage with raw um, you know, ideas and to see genuinely how we feel. Uh, and so um, uh, they have generously allowed me to begin. Uh, and then inshallah, I'll pass it over to uh, Ustad Uthman and then uh, uh, Sheikh uh, Tom. And inshallah, then after that, we'll have a discussion. So from my side, I have three points that um, again are in my head. So I'm going to try to verbalize them in the best manner uh, possible. Uh, the first point that I have, jumping straight to the, the 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 issue here at hand, in my reading of the Quran, in my reading of the Sunnah, in my analysis of the Sirah, I find that the issue of establishing Islamic political authority, independent Islamic political authority, is not something that is central and emphasized as much as uh, so many other aspects are emphasized. In fact. I've tried to rack my you know, knowledge and brain and, and look at the Quran and Sunnah to see where there is a direct command upon the community to do so. And it is difficult for me to find an explicit verse in contrast to many dozens of other you know, commands and prohibitions. Now, true, reading the Quran and the Sunnah and knowing the aspects of the Sharia, there is an implicit understanding. There's an implicit derivation that, for example, when Allah says, you know, this is the penalty of hiraba, this is the penalty of zina, you know, then clearly there has to be a polity, there has to be an established, you know, uh, a political entity to uh, enact, uh, you know, these these realities of the Sharia. And so, no doubt, uh, it is healthy. It is a part and parcel of the long term agenda and goal of the Sharia to have uh, a land where all of the laws are applied. But and my analysis, and of course, that's why I'm having conversation, could be right or wrong. If we were to list the 100 priorities of the ummah, if we were to go over the 100, you know, obligations or what, you know, a Muslim should do, in my assessment and understanding, the obligation on the individual Muslim to make a concerted effort to establish a, a political establishment on this earth would be very, very low on this list, not very high on this list. It's a generic fard kifaya. I'll be the first to say this, but there are four are more important fard kifayas, number one. And number two, not to mention there's a whole host of fard ains. Like even before you get to fard kifaya, there's a whole host of fard ains. So if I were to start thinking about how many verses say aminu, or how many verses say, you know, aqimu salah, how many verses say establish the zakah, how many verses say believe in the day of judgment, you know, even speaking the truth, or waziru bil qistas al mustaqim, or be good to your parents, you know, on and on, and the prohibitions as well, on and on. But when I start thinking about where exactly specifically are we being told, even as a community, directly, unequivocally, uh, to establish an independent system, you know, I find. I find it difficult to find the level of emphases. Now, again, again, to be clear, it is understood by some commandments that this needs to exist, but Allah Azza wa Jal did not make it an obligation to the same level that he made obligation to so many other things. And this is, in fact, in my humble opinion, we're still point number one, in conformity with the reality of the theological principle, at taklifu bima la yutaq, being burdened with that which a person cannot do. You know, the average uncles and aunties, man, come on, they can barely run a masjid, you know, they can, even if that. And to assume that, you know, the awam of the ummah, to assume that the bulk of the ummah, this is one of the main obligations on them, you're 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 putting on them an obligation that doesn't exist and also not even they're not even capable of doing. So, in my humble opinion, first point, I have three, as I said. It's a generic fard kifaya. Some people should do it great, and may Allah bless them. Uh, but it's not the emphases, and that's why my da'wah is not based upon these emphases. The second point I have, and this is theological as well. To me, a reading of this Quran <laughs> and Sunnah is very clear that Jannah and salvation is not contingent on establishing an Islamic political entity. On the other hand, Jannah is contingent on a host of other factors, personal piety, tazkiyat nafs iqamat salah avoiding the major sins, and on and on and on. And so looking at the world around us, it makes little sense for me who has limited time, limited capacity, limited bandwidth, limited influence to leave that which a person needs to go to Jannah and to start talking about that which Yani, even if it does exist, at max, it's going to be beneficial, but it will not inherently lead to Jannah. In other words, even if we have an ideal Islamic political land, 
there will be plenty of people, they're still doing kabayid inside of it since the time of the Sahaba, even in the time of the Prophet there'll be plenty of people that are struggling with faith inside of it. On the other hand, there are people struggling with faith and I can talk to them directly. I can speak to them directly. So an Islamic state, an ideal Islamic state will not guarantee that every person is going to go to Jannah. Agreed, it might mitigate factors that cause people to leave, but it can't prevent. On the other hand, directly jumping into tazkiyah and aqidah and tasfiyah and iman and taqwiyat al-iman and encouraging people to do good and, and abstaining from evil, it will have an immediate impact that shall actually be salvational. And so this is my second point, that looking at what is salvational, looking at you know what Jannah is contingent on and that I have limited bandwidth, it just makes logical sense for me to concentrate on the bigger picture, to concentrate on that which is more important. The third and final opinion, and this is, I know, going to get me into some trouble as if the first two aren't, but khair, we're being honest here. That's the whole point. We're trying to really be honest. And if I'm wrong, khalas, bismillah, correct me. That's the point. But I have to be honest here that I lament the fact, raw, unfiltered, I'm saying how I feel, that those parties that have been involved in Islamic politics for the last six, seven, eight decades, right? Those, those in movements, and you know what they are. In my humble opinion, they have failed to give us a viable and well thought out and holistic and practical and tangible vision for how such a modern Islamic state would function in the world that we live in. Now, you know, and I know I'm being stereotypical, but let's be real here in terms of the people we interact with online, the Facebook people and whatnot, and you know the 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 overzealous folks that are online. If you listen to some of these people describe their version of an Islamic state, their notions of a modern Muslim uh, khilafah, frankly, I'm not trying to be dismissive or too harsh or or or, or mocking. It's as if they have a halalified, you know, socialist uh, Norway. You know, they want like. Denmark, that is all hijabis, you know what I'm saying? Like free education, free healthcare, free housing, minimal crimes, minimal this and that. Okay, um, how will this state function? How will uh, uh, all of this be, 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 be taken? I mean, simple reality, Islamic law forbids taxes. There is, I mean, Islamic law, everybody knows you shouldn't tax the people. Khalas, where are you going to, you're going to do jizya? You're gonna you're gonna keep on waging jihad against the rest of the world and the modern world we live in. You know, uh, does an Islamic political state actually have to provide free health care? Again, with utmost respect to the people who believe it does, read your history. Even if you find anecdotes here and there for the bulk of the ummah, no, there wasn't free health care. There wasn't free education. There were crimes taking place. There were, you know, uh, uh, they were yani, well known in the time of the Umayyads and the Abbasids. How can a modern state even function disconnected from the UN, disconnected from the global network uh, uh, of banks? Also, again, uh, have we thought out uh, again, we have these idealistic notions. Oh, gender segregation. Oh, everybody's going to be dressed properly. Okay, what will a modern Islamic state do if women are protesting? We don't want to uh, wear the hijab. Is it allowed and justifiable to use lethal force? Can the army come and shoot people because they want? They don't want to do. Uh, uh, they, they're doing a minor sin. Let's say. Is it? Is it? I mean, to what level are you going to jail them for not praying uh, fajr, for example? So how, how? I mean, again, so many questions. How do we navigate the spectrum of of madahib? Have we thought through this even? Simple reality of abortion, right? Again, whether you like it or not, the ahnaf have positions that many people cringe at. The shafi'is, the malikis, that it's a spectrum. So what are you going to do? You're going to adopt one and ignore the others, or so have we even thought things through in this regard? What I find, and again, I, I hope I'm proven wrong, I find slogans, emotional slogans that appeal to the masses, but not really thought out. And I find people who don't have much political acumen, political experience, with grandiose visions of how this utopia is going to be without thinking things through. We have in front of our eyes modern attempts, including ISIS, whether you like it or not, they were following versions of Sharia that are mainstream, including the Taliban. Do we want to have a Taliban-like uh, um, uh, uh, enterprise, uh, including uh, uh, Iran, despite our theological differences with them, right? Look at how discontent the people are. Look at how much ilhad and atheism and secularism is spreading because they hate 
the religious clergy that have been put in charge of them. So my third point is practically, pragmatically, logistically, have you, uh, the groups that are involved in these and always criticizing the rest of us, have you really given us um, food for thought? Have you worked out how you would actually be doing this, especially post-Arab Spring? And we see the dismal failure, 75 years of attempts. You get to the office and you can't even, keep. with my love and respect, my heart is with those people, with the protesters, with the people killed. But I'm sorry, you know, hindsight's 2020. So I, I have to say, you know, you haven't shown to me that you are a viable force that I can even trust. And so my third point is logistics. So to conclude, I'm 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 really happy to hear of certain people involved on this front wanting to establish you know a political system all the best to them my duas are for them wallahi I wish that they succeed but I personally find my bandwidth is limited my experiences are different my forte is different my strength is different and so for me I find that I need to concentrate my work and my effort in other areas even as I wish the best, best for those people working on this front. And inshallah, if and when they are successful, you know, you will find me at the forefront, you know, supporting something of this nature. You are not going to find me stopping you in your way. Uh, but at the same time, don't make me an enemy and don't make us an enemy when all we're simply saying and pointing out is we don't think this is the number one priority. You do you, you do all the best. And inshallah, we hope the best if you're successful, we'll be following you in those endeavors. So this was a summary of my uh, few points, inshallah. And with that, I'll hand it over to Ustad Uthman for his uh, uh, few 10, 15 minutes. And then we're going to go to Sheikh uh, uh, Imam Tom. Bismillah. Jazakumullah khairan, Sheikh Yasir. We also, I think we agree just for the audience's benefit that the, in the first sessions, we went directly respond to each other so that we can sort of present what we uh, present our original thoughts and then we'll come back and engage on these um, on these points and I think Shaf Yas has, has raised some very important uh, very important critical questions um so in my 10 minutes I want to again put on the table some thoughts that I had on the topic um there are points that we we will agree on there are some that we um, think differently on um I want to mention probably three points, elaborate on three points as a starting point. Um, the first being on the place of the Khilafah, of the Caliphate in okay. Islam. I think that's the central question that really we're asking today. And uh, the other question we're asking is, you know, form and method. I think mean, those are the three major, major lines of inquiry that we're touching on. What is the place of the Khilafah in Islam? And number two, in our particular context in the late modern world, uh, what form will it take? What form can it take? What's the method to go about this? So maybe uh, three thoughts on those three points. First of all, on the question of obligation, um, as, as far as my uh, study and reading goes, and I think this is a fairly uncontroversial point as far as classical scholarship goes, the Khilafah is, a, is an obligation. Uh, it is a fard kifaya. Uh, but nevertheless, it's a established um, and it's an established obligation, and it's an obligation that I would argue has uh, you know, significant priority. Now, hey, there's a lot of things that can be said here, but I think if I uh, just mention two or three um, articulations from our tradition uh, that elaborate both on what the place and the the role of the Khilafah is. And also, it's it's hukum that it's better that would be better than me talking sort of in generic terms. Um, I can start. I'll probably start with um, uh, Imam al-Mawardi's very concise um, articulation in al uh, al Sultaniyah, in which he says that al imamatu mawdu'atun li khilafat al-nubuwa fi hirasat al-dini wa siyasat al-dunya. That the imama denotes succession of prophethood in the protection of the deen. And the management of the worldly affairs. Uh, and contracting it to someone in the ummah to fulfill this role is an obligation by ijma. Uh, this I this point that it's an obligation and that is the consensus on the obligation um, is again fairly uncontroversial and very common to find in the classical tradition. Um, but I think it's important to highlight here also, uh, although this definition is very concise. Is really getting to the point and the place of the Khilafah in the deen 
uh, which is that it can be understood as uh, you know, the, the form of Islamic governance, but um, it's it's about preservation of the deen and managing the worldly affairs in accordance with the deen. And um, really, you can we can go further than this. And in fact, actually, again, let me let me allow the the, uh, the the scholars to speak here in a way. The second um, authority I would articulate, and I'm using the ones that are very concise, a line or two max. Uh, Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, he says in Siyasa uh, Shari'ah that يجب أن يعرف أن ولاة أمر الناس من أعظم واجبات الدين. It's uh, it's imperative to know that the office in charge of governing the affairs of the people, which is the Khilafah, is one of the greatest obligations of the deen. So again, this touches on not only the, the hukum, but the, the place, the priority. is one of the greatest. أعظم واجبات الدين. In fact, he goes further. بل لا قيام للدين ولا للدنيا إلا بها. In fact, nay, there is no the, the deen is not established, uh, nor is the, the nor, nor can we manage the affairs of the world properly except by it. So, now uh, the, the another way of saying this would be well, Islam has many aspects to it, and without the governance aspect, you have to let go of large portions of the deen. Um, and and in that sense, you cannot uh, we cannot. Uh, bring the deen into practice, into a, a lived mode of being without uh, the governance aspect to it. My final uh, citation, if you will, will be from Imam Al-Qurtubi uh, in his tafsir of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي جَاعِدٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةً uh, Imam Al-Qurtubi says in his tafsir, هَذِهِ الْآيَةُ أَصْلٌ فِي نَصْبِ إِمَامٍ وَخَلِيفَةً This ayah is an evidence, uh, in fact, probably the pr primary evidence um, or the main evidence, or the foundational evidence for the appointment of an Imam and Khalifa. Who is obeyed. Um, so that he, around which, because of which we establish unity. The ahkam are established. There is no difference of opinion on this, on the, on the obligation of this between the Ummah or between the scholars. Except one of the uh, Abu Bakr al-Assam, one of the Kibar of Mu'tazila, about whom um, Imam Qurti plays on the words and says he said this because he was deaf with respect to the Sharia. In other words, this is غير معتبر. This is this opinion doesn't have any value. So I think these are these are sufficient. There are many more of those type of articulations in the classical tradition that I think establish not only the obligation. Uh, but I will argue the priority, the uh, the very high priority of the caliphate. Now, we talk about evidences. Um, I will stick to my original sort of notes, rough notes, in which I didn't want to go into the evidences. Uh, there are many evidences. There is a consilience of evidence on the basis of which the scholars are making this point. Obviously, when scholars say there's an obligation, it can't come out of the, kind of out of the blue. There are evidences in the Quran. There are evidence in the Sunnah. There are evidence in Ijma' al-Sahab, arguably the most Strong evidence is Ijma' Sahaba. There are also evidence in application of Kawaid Usuliyah and Kawaid Fiqhiyah. I'm happy to, to, to refer to specific points. And I would like to come back to Sheikh Yasser's point about the lack of explicit evidence in the Quran. Um, so, so that's as far as the evidence goes. Now, I would make an additional point here quickly that uh, classically there is no Mu'tabar um, Ikhtilaf on this point. Uh, in contemporary times, in the modern period, there is, for obvious reasons perhaps, um, there is some uh, ikhtilaf, uh, some which I again would not consider of value, which explicitly denies the religious obligation. People like uh, uh, Javed Ghamidi, for example. Uh, but more considerable, if we go into more sort of reputable authorities, contemporary authorities, they won't um, deny the theoretical obligation, but they will kind of end up somewhere like where Sheikh Yasser has articulated um, of sort of a practical, what we can call a practical uh, negation of the obligation, not a theoretical one. So you affirm the theoretical obligation, but you end up in a place where uh, it's not all that important. It's not all that uh, obligatory. Um, and uh, I, I haven't got time to go into that more fully, but I've written an article on this titled Questioning the Caliphate. And it's published on the Omatics Institute's website that people can refer to. Uh, we'll probably come back to talk about some of the particulars of that. 
Uh, in my remaining five odd minutes, um, the other two points I would make, one is on method. So this is an obligation. Okay, how do you go about it? Here, there's a lot more room for movement, as it were. Here, it's a matter of ishtiyat. This is not a, uh, there's no clear cut method. There's no uh, set blueprint that we get from anywhere. Of course, if we get it from somewhere, we get it from the Prophet wasallam. The Prophet wasallam, it should be mentioned, did uh, establish an Islamic governance, which became later on after his death, the Khilafah. Um, only because the Khilafah is conceived of as succession. Otherwise, in the form, there's no significant difference between the polity that he established and the one that Abu Bakr anhu, took over. Um, so he did establish that, and he did so from scratch, if you will. And so definitely that is our starting point to start thinking about the method, and there's a lot of work that's been done on that. But I would argue that that's not a that establishes for us broad parameters as yeah. opposed to an A to Z blueprint that we can copy-paste into our own time. Um, what are those broad parameters? Um, things like, for example, he didn't use material or violent means. And so the, the method was um, at its core to uh, build and to, to establish an entity grounded in the, in the conviction of people not forcing something against their will. Um, uh, also, a couple of other things that I mentioned in these parameters, uh, there was what we might call intellectual work, dawa work, groundwork to foster that conviction um, in society. But there was also political struggle in, in Mecca, uh, you know, uh, with Quraysh, with the leaders of Quraysh, inviting them, pushback, boycott. There was struggle. And I think this is a very important point because in the uh, in the Islamosphere uh, or in the Dawah sphere, if I can call it that, uh, it's almost cliched to say that you know, Prophet Sallallahu worked for 13 years on Iman, on Tarbiyah, on Aqidah before he did anything else. Uh, which I would submit is a truth, but a half truth, uh, because well, depending on how you define those things, usually what's being implied is that uh, what we should be doing is sort of you know, halakat, lessons, lectures, dawah of that nature, intellectual, uh, uh, intellectual, but also sort of pedagogical, educational, right, pastoral. But that's it. So it stops short of the it stops short of the political, and I think that's that's. A half truth, if not a misrepresentation, because there's a lot more going on in the first 13 years with the Rasul Sallam than just that. Um, so, so uh, intellectual work, political struggle, things of this nature. Um, that's my second point. My third and final point um, would be that I think a lot of these points. I don't think any of this is really controversial. There are details that we can look at. I actually think one of the things that we suffer from uh, or large portions of the Ummah suffer from are not are not gr grounded or rooted in the misunderstanding of the text. That's there, but I don't think that's the that's the, the driver. I think one of the things that drives this is uh, an almost self-afflicted uh, or a learned helplessness, uh, an almost defeatist attitude, a short-sightedness perhaps, a political naivete perhaps, a pessimism. All things which go against the tradition, right? Our tradition teaches us, Allah and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi teach us to be optimistic, to have faith, to have tawakkul, to think big, right? And this is like absolutely clear in the seerah and in the examples of the Sahaba. But we tend to shut ourselves down. Um, and now I'll make just one point here because I'm running out of time. If we think, because I'm thinking at the Ummah level, I'm thinking at the political level, at the geopolitical level, and the possibilities, because I think a lot of people start from the possibility and go, this is really, really, really hard. This ain't going to happen, right? And then that that they, they're looking back at the text through that lens. And therefore, they they may come to conclusions which really, in my reading, clash with things that are very clear uh, in the tradition and the scholarly uh, articulations. But but if we you know think about just 30 years ago, let's look at the world geopolitical 30 years ago in two minutes. Uh, China. Look at China then and now. China in the 1980s was third world. Not that significant. China today, the US and Europe have stood up and have to pay attention and everyone's going, I wonder what they're going to do next. They're right there at the top. They have to be taken seriously. 30 years, 30, 40 years. Look at Turkey. 
30 years ago and today. Massive differences. Uh, look at the US. 30 years ago, after the fall of the Soviet Union, it was on top of the world. It thought, uh, you know, it, you know, uh, in political terms, it is God on earth. Now it's back amongst the pool of players. And there are many other examples that can be used. My point is, significant changes can happen even in small periods of times, politically and historically speaking, let alone bigger. So uh, to extend that forward, there will be significant changes in the next 30, in the next 30 odd years, 20, 30, 50 years. There will be significant changes. That's not, the, that's not uh, I don't think anyone doubts that. The question is, what role will the Ummah play in that? Will we continue to play a role where we are an object, uh, where we are a passive recipient, or will we, uh, will we start slowly but surely to dream to think, to imagine, to work, and to drive some of this change. I have no doubt that we can do it comparatively with any other force in the world today. But I think it's a matter of mindset and a matter of um, uh, will and and uh, and strategy as much as a number of other things. But I'll stop there, and um, we can come back to some of these issues. Zakallah khair. Very beneficial. Zakallah khair. Imam Tom, Bismillah, your turn. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu salam rasulillah, Allahumma arun al-haqqa haqqa wa rizqan al-tiba'a wa arun al-ba'ata 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 wa rizqan al-jitinaba. I apologize, my throat's been a little scratchy all day, but um, I'll get right to it. So uh, does the Sharia have such a notion of the khilafa and the ob obligation of the khilafa? I'd say absolutely yes, I think that's beyond doubt. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Tanisa, inna anzalna ilayka al-kitab bilhaq li tahkuma bayna al-nas he said, subhanahu wa ta'ala, that certainly we have sent down to you, he's talking to the Prophet, والسلام, the book, in truth. Why? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لِتَحْكُمَ بَيْنَ النَّاسِ So that you would judge between the people. Anybody who knows tafsir, the Arabic language, they know that the lamb that's used here is lamb ta'lil. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying the reason why, right, that he sent down this book, so that the Prophet وسلم, could rule. Rule who? An nas alif lam listig rak al jins the people, all the people, not just the Muslims. Uh, the hadith we have uh, hadith in Sahih Muslim and khala yadan min ta'atin laqi Allah ha yom al qiyamati la hujjat lah wa man mata wa laysa fi unqihi bayatun mata mayta tanjahiliyatan that the person who removes his hand from obedience. He meets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment without a clear argument or convincing argument. And whoever dies and he does not have upon his neck a bay'ah, uh, an oath of allegiance, then he dies a death of jahiliyyah, of ignorance. Now, these are things that are fairly direct. And as uh, Dr. Uthman has has already previously mentioned, the scholarly literature on the interpretation of these texts is, is fairly uncontroversial and clear as to what that entails. Um, there are several rational arguments also to be made for the necessity and the obligation of the Khilafa, one of them, that believing that the Sharia is the supreme form of law or societal organization, that in itself is an article of faith for every Muslim and the one that they should have. Allah says in Surah Al-Ma'idah, وَمَنْ لَمْ يَحْكُمْ بِمَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْكَافِرُونَ Those who do not rule by what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed, then they are the deniers. Uh, and so we have, yes, this notion of supri uh, Sharia supremacy is actually an article of faith for us. Uh, we also have, uh, and this is an argument that also the, scho the classical scholars bring up, all of the rulings that we have, whether it's criminal law or uh, miroth or this, that, or the third. If we don't take the necessary means to create the structures to implement them, then what becomes of these ayat? They become essentially ink on paper which is not befitting of the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is supposed to be implemented. Uh, another rational argument comes from, uh, as Dr. Uthman brought up, sort of the idea of the khalifa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to people, uh, the creation of people in Surah Al-Baqarah, with not actually a, a name of like their species or not a name of, that's merely descriptive. It's actually an aspirational term. In Nija'ilun fil ardi khalifa. He says that I'm going to place on earth a successor, one who is going to rule and do things according to the wishes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
So there's a microcosm, macrocosm aspect here. Okay, the microcosm is that every single individual has a responsibility to be Allah's Khalifa upon earth when it comes to what they have authority over. And so why would we not have a collective responsibility to also therefore establish a Khalifa in order to rule society and rule uh, in order in the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have us rule? And then finally, we have the famous uh, principle in the Sula Fiqh, uh, that uh, the uh, the scholar Amir Bahjat he put in a in a couplet of Arabic he said malayutim wajibun ilabihi fa wajibun fahisalat ilabihi that if there you have something that is uh, obligatory then any you know constituent part that is also that is necessary to fulfill that obligation therefore becomes obligatory in and of itself so I think that it's fairly uncontroversial to say that the, the khilafa is something. Um, Islamic governance, whatever we want to call it, is a yes, it is an important um it is it is an important obligation upon upon the Muslims. How do we achieve it? Okay, well, that's where the devil's in the details. Um I want to I want to clarify, I think, one misconception that a lot of people, nobody here, alhamdulillah, but that you hear when people start talking about khilaf and politics, there's this sense of inevitability right that people sort of refer to when they think about time and they think about history they say well we can't go back in time and that's as you know dr Uthman said a half truth right this is a half truth okay yes you cannot ever literally go back in time okay you cannot recreate exactly the same historical circumstances the same dates the same events uh, but history is not simply linear it is cyclical things go in cycles they go back and forth we've even seen in the united states recently how you know with uh decades of planning and agitation and strategy, um, the Catholic right has been able to overturn Roe versus Wade, something that nobody thought was possible. You know, compare that to, say, 2015 and the other sorts of years where legislation in the United States has passed that has allowed uh, homosexual marriage or a lot of other sorts of things. In the same breath, people saying, oh, well, now you can't go back and, and change it. Well, obviously, you can. You actually can. You can go back and change things. You, there is a pathway to do it. Um, but it's the how. That's the important thing. And I would I would assert, and I think that um, Dr. Uthman and my sort of takes here are going to be fairly similar, that you can't unlock uh, true Islamic governance without reversing some of the central features of two main forces, and that would be the European colonialism and secularism. Um, there's a lot there, um, but in the brief time that I have, I'll say that politically, the Sharia must be the ultimate authority over the government and not vice versa. The government must not be the authority over the Sharia. Uh, the government cannot be allowed to make the Sharia or the scholars, etc. It's plaything. And this is the difference between genuine, authentic Islamic governance, or at least, let's say, sustainable and true Islamic governance in something like a theocracy that we have in Iran or other places where you have a complete centralization uh, of religious scholarship. So there's something that's very, very important, a feature there, that's the decentralization of religious scholarship, the independence, both economic and political independence of the ulama is something that is extremely, extremely important to generating the proper theory and application and as we'll see in a second, in my little time that we have left, subject formation that has to go into turning this thing around and trying to get anything like a khilafa. Um, how are we going to do it? Um, how how can we possibly make uh, an ulama that is decentralized and independent uh, economically and politically? Well, we already have a model, and that's the waqf. We have the religious endowment. This is something that is decentralized. It is out of the hands of the government. And the interesting thing, the interesting thing is that in Western countries, we're allowed to make it, right? Maybe in some other countries that are Muslim majority countries, even uh, you're perhaps not allowed or your assets would be seized. But we have this technology, this economic political technology in our tradition, the waqf, um, which was actually no secret was the first target of the European colonists when they came to the Muslim lands. Um, so we need to get the waqf back. Part of the reason for that is because we need to get independent or the map back, and that is a, a huge ingredient in how we do it. Um, we need to, the second thing I'll say politically is undoing sort of, or taking account for the subject formation. So a lot of people misunderstand when they think that we're going to bring back a khilafah, we're going to bring back uh, Islamic law or something like that. It's just about a system. It's just about developing laws and slapping those laws on society. And this is where I think Dr. Uthman was going when he was talking about what were those first 13 years. They were subject formation. 
right? Subject formation was an extremely, extremely important part of it. Uh, it wasn't the only part of it, as was mentioned, but it was an extremely important part. Developing a consciousness and a, and a way of identifying oneself that's not going to fall prey to nationalism, that's not going to fall prey to this sort of ethnic superiority, which would make us susceptible to balkanization or these sorts of other things that have been only a liability on the ummah and not something working for us. And then just a few points uh, economically, I think if we're going to undo some of the economic uh, hardship that the Muslim commu community and the ummah is struggling against, then obviously we need economic independence. We just see how you know the United States and other powers have frozen the assets of the Taliban in Afghanistan. There needs to be, and this is not my sphere of expertise, um, so I'd be interested to talk to actual economists, um, but some sort of economic independence, whether it's financial independence or just being able to avoid sanctions, uh, being able to not have your assets frozen. Um, this is a very, very important ingredient when it comes to reestablishing a khilafah that's actually going to be sustainable. The final thing um, I'd like to touch on just briefly is, is there a prophetic method for doing this? Uh, and uh, I would say, and I think this is in accordance with what has been mentioned already, that reestablishing a khilafah is not something that's ta'abudi, or it's not something that's tawqifi, right? It's not something that the methods of doing so are strictly limited, such that the burden of proof would be upon you to justify it, first of all. Rather, it's the opposite way, where it's anything that doesn't explicitly violate the sharia is something that would be a legitimate and open tool to use. Um, and so we have, you know, what is the prophetic method? We see tadarruj, right? We could say that that's even sunnah, the sunnah of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, to use a sort of tadarruj approach and a gradualist approach. That doesn't necessarily mean gradualist within the system, okay? But the, the literal meaning of the word is that people are going to take time to, to change their subjectivities. Systems are going to take time in order to be built, and you can't do it all in one breath. Um, and then the idea of subject formation, which is necessitates sort of maybe the stage that we're at right now, which is the stage of apologetics and the stage of da'wah and the stage of, you know, deconstructing people's colonized subjectivities and then making way to restructure uh, and reconstruct those subjectivities in a way that is more adherent to the Sharia and Allah knows best. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Zakumullah khair, alhamdulillah. So these were three, uh, sorry, you know, my voice is also going right now. I don't know what's going on. Uh, these are three uh, uh, nice statements. So let us see where we are in agreement. I like we all use the term fard kifaya. So far, that's clear. We're all in the agreement of fard kifaya. Uh, we're also in agreement that it is uh, something that the sharia requires in order for some of the ahkam to be established or else those ahkam are not going to be established. Um, we're also in agreement that it is healthy that, you know, some of us are getting involved in this. Uh, I think I sense from the three of us as well that uh, we do need to plan and strategize, um, you know, in a in a manner. None of us said that it is tawqifi. We all said uh, that uh, the mechanisms of doing so are open for ijtihad. Did I miss anything? Okay, so where are we in disagreement? Uh, I think quite clearly is the sense of the level of fard kifaya, where it comes in the grand scale of things. I think this is where uh, we are, we seem to be on different wavelengths. For me, it is an established fact that since the beginning of this ummah, there have always been groups of Muslims that are living as minorities outside of its fields. And uh, at times, these minorities were frowned upon by the majority, and at times, they flourished. So, but, but it's always been the case. And these minorities, by and large, organically, continue to give da'wah, preach to others. But unless it so happened that the ruler converted, which is what happened in certain areas of Malaysia, and in, for example, the Maldives, unless the rulers themselves converted, we do not know of any of these types of peoples actively engaging in uh, 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 overthrowing the the people of their countries, you know, or their lands, and of 
uh, I, I'm talking about as from within, obviously, right? I'm talking about those that are minorities. I'm not talking about uh, Muslim lands being invaded. And that's why there are still Muslim minorities in many of these places. Um, in the Bulgars, there used to be a Muslim, uh, you know, this is where Hungary and other places there used to be as well. Um, uh, other places as well uh, that had um, uh, these lands were um, in, in pockets of Europe, uh, in Italy as well, there were small pockets, in Sicily even as well. For a period, the Khilafah was established here, but then for a while, when it was overthrown, the Muslims lived as a minority under Christian rule. So there is an undeniable reality that we've always had these pockets of uh, precedents to look at. Sometimes those precedents ended in negative ways, like the Andalusian Muslims, right? But the question arises, what do you do when they didn't? What if the society allowed them to function and flourish? What is their role as a minority living under a majority? And I would venture that neither the Sharia nor common sense, neither our texts nor tangible reality would require us as minorities. Now we're talking specifically about us as minorities to get involved with the political powers of the lands that we live in, in a manner that is a threat to those powers, because that becomes an existential threat to our existence. Okay, so that's something I think we didn't quite touch on, but uh, I, I, I want to put it out there as well for a for discussion. But anyway, I think um, this is my sense. Anyone that want to add uh, agreement and disagreement before we get to some discussion? You know, I, have I have some, some summary. That, but are we laying out the disagreements or I, I have some thoughts on that? Um, that's if we're responding or yeah. So go ahead, Bismillah. Um, you know, I think that that there's two things that that strike me. Um, and and one is that the call for a khilafah or Islamic governance does not necessarily involve an overthrow, right? I think that might might be a mischaracterization or an over narrowing of what might be imagined. Um, if you imagine even the way that the Prophet ﷺ established political power, right? I mean, it was kind of like building power, political struggle, exile, and then coming back. And at the end of the day, at Fatah Mecca, right, you have most people kind of converting and accepting, right? Is that an overthrow in the same sense that like someone is saying, well, we're citizens of a country and, you know, we're overthrowing? No, no, no. I don't want to get close to that, right? I don't think that's what's being advocated for. The other thing, and, and this is a little bit more theoretical, I think that a big question that's going to determine how we're looking at this is, do we believe that modern power is unique or do we believe that modern power is something that is the same as pre-modern power, right? And it was interesting to me that um, Dr. Uthman, you know, uh, has an interest in continental philosophy because I do too. Um, and, you know, anybody who, you know, reads Foucault, Foucault's whole thing, right, is that there's a, a, a very different type of power that's being exercised in the modern era. And we need to pay attention to that difference because it actually does affect Islam's viability in certain spaces. His basic thing was that in the pre-modern era, you had this thing called sovereign power. Okay. So sovereign power is, you know, the Sultan calls you or the King calls you and, you know, he chops your head off or he tortures you or something like that. These sort of gruesome, elaborate displays that everybody's aware of. And Foucault is like, well, the modern era is defined by a different type of power that's called disciplinary power. And disciplinary power is basically, we're going to come in and we're going to change your subjectivity. We're going to change how you understand your identity, your own tradition, and everything else, right? So I think we need to take that very, very seriously as Muslims because if we're allowing our, if we're looking at pre-modern examples of where Muslim minorities assuming that power works in the pre-modern way, then yeah, okay, we're fine. Like, you know, we're allowed to kind of, nobody's trying to change Islam. You don't have people who are like Orientalists telling us that the waqf is actually a bid'ah right before the modern period, right? But then once you get into the modern period, this modern type of power is like, we would rather, in order to make you a malleable subject, we're going to change you from the inside. That's the scary thing. That's what lights the fire and the urgency as to, well, okay, uh, maybe we need to start maneuvering and strategizing so that we don't come to a point in history where we think that we're actually believing Muslims, but actually the rugs have been pulled out from under us. So who's going to possibly disagree with that, that um, you know, um, uh, Foucault's analysis of power uh, is a realm that every one of us should get involved with. We need to try our best to influence uh, and not just to stop the influence of, of modern liberalism and humanism and secularism, which is quite clearly seeping through our youth. But we also need to supplant it with what we believe 
to be the truth. This is what well, this is what intellectual da'wah is. Who's going to possibly disagree with that? Actually, this is, I would say, in conformity with what I'm saying, is that the battles that we have, the tangible battles that we have, the level of prioritization and even the logistical realities force us to get involved with these types of things. And these are actually better in the long run. And this is the equivalent of preaching against paganism. I would say this is sirah. This is the equivalent because we don't have modern idolatry the way that the Quraysh have, but we do have modern intellectual idolatry, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, this is, I would say this is what all of us, you know, uh, should be doing. And I hope, inshallah, I'm doing it in my little uh, niche and forte. So Zakallah, excellent. Uthman, would you like to add something? Yeah, yeah. I think that there's a connection here between some of these threads. Um, uh, I might... Uh, uh, disagree or push back a little bit on this on, on the last point you said there Sheikh Yasser about uh, that's what we do in, in da'wah or in intellectual pedagogical work the difference in my mind would be the content uh, which we decide to delimit our intellectual work to right so normally um, and if I take your, your work generally as an example of that but obviously most perhaps most uh, or many other scholars in du'at as well the content seems to stop at the political. Or if it includes certain aspects of the political, they're very selective. And so, so for example, uh, creating that awareness about the caliphate, Islamic governance, not just as a historical reality, but as a normative part of the tradition that we need to think about and do something about is generally not part of the intellectual work that happens uh, in, these, in these domains. That we, that's where I think the difference is. So otherwise, I include that work to be part of the method. And whereas it seems that when you talk about the method, you, you, you sort of move very quickly to overthrowing the government, political struggle, that the, the, the hardest stuff, which I think can't always be escaped. I'm not saying that's not part of it. That will also be uh, potentially, not necessarily, but potentially a part of the picture at some point, but that's not where it starts. Okay, so I think the, 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 what we agree on is the need for intellectual work or da'wah work, whatever we want to call it, subject formation, right? Or what uh, we sometimes refer to as uh, discourse formation. You need to establish, you need to change the, the hegemonic discourse uh, to move in your favor, right? The language, the concepts, and so on and so forth. Uh, but that can be done in so many different ways. Some people, intellectual work just means aqidah in a certain sense, tarbiyah in a certain sense, tasfiyah in a certain sense. Um, but in a certain sense, that's just cutting off certain aspects of the deen. Jay, so uh, I think I think you're right, to be honest. And my preaching and da'wah, I'm not going to you know, uh, sugarcoat it. It doesn't reflect the level of political sentiment that perhaps you would have done had you been in my place. There's no denying that. But you need to understand why. Number one, I am speaking to people that come to Jumu'ah once a week, listening to a khutbah. I have 25 minutes. The bulk of them are struggling to practice the bare minimum of Islam. I have to prioritize what they need. So if you understand my paradigm and I explain, I have no problem, Fard Kifaya, you guys come together in a room with all the top intellectuals, think about this stuff. But I think it is and, I, and I'll say this bluntly, it is a problem to mention that which is not needed by them at the expense of that which is needed by them. These people are not even praying. And by the way, when I say these people, I mean the bulk of the people that listen to my lectures are struggling with basic stuff of haram and halal, basic stuff of arkan. And it's my job, and I'm also struggling with this, I'm not the stuff I'm making a tazkiyah of myself. It's my job to increase their iman, bring them closer to Allah, the tazkiyah of the nafs, etc., etc. Again, and, and, uh, uh, let me let me say this gently. Yaqi, we all have elders in our community, the uncles, aunts, we all have the board members. Well, do you really think that we constantly should be making this a matter of even 30%, even 20% of our talks? In my humble opinion, and that's been my philosophy, one out of every hundred or one out of every fifty do a little bit of yani, you know, something that will bring them that type of awareness, you know. And even that I do more as a sense of izza to their pride. And listen to my, you know, the khatras giving my masjid. Every third, fourth is a historical one that brings a little bit of pride in their past. It's not even directly, hey, you guys, you have to be politically involved because 
the awam are never primarily politically involved, you know? So I Actually, feel... I agree with that. I agree with that. Okay. Um, in fact, if, I, if I just quickly add to this, um, um, add and take the discussion forward as well. I give, I, I give the khutbah on, on a regular basis as well. I think these days I'm once a month, which I am comfortable with. <laughs> I don't like to have too much regular responsibility in that respect. Uh, so I give it, it's like the rest of the ummah, of a microcosm of lay Muslims. And in, you know, 52, no, once a month, so 12 khutbahs a year, I might talk about the Khilafah once. Yeah, you, once okay, that, that's for, my for point. For exact reason. But, he's, but having agreed on that point where I might disagree is you're focusing on that subset of the ummah is... Uh, is 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 I'm not, I don't think that's the correct subset we should be talking about. Uh, if if we're going to have a sort of or what we should be doing is saying, okay, what are the various subsets in the ummah A B C D E? Okay, E. Yep, you're right. That's not you're not going to talk to them about them every single day. But what about the academics? What about the scholars? What about the tulabul ilm? What about the activists? So I think we need to think of the ummah in collective terms, Mumtaz. and then come back and look at where where these things can happen. Zero disagreement, Sheikh Uthman. Zero. I am 100% with you. So why don't you organize a conference this June? Choose a Muslim country, okay? All of us will come there <laughs> and we'll talk about this topic. Excellent. Bring the top minds. Bring the movers and shakers. Bring the intellectual leaders. Those that are at a different wavelength and they probably are mini leaders in their own spheres. And let's talk about a global reality of what can be done but to expect the duaat and the preachers you know to make this a priority i i think this is a mistake and i think that we need to filter our message down to the level that our people need so and i think we're in agreement on this i think i mean i don't know tom do you want to add to this yeah, yeah just to just to add a little uh another way to look at it i think that you know if we expand our conception of what politics are, then we actually find that it does become extremely relevant to the average Mohammed and Fatima. Um, not talking about, you know, being involved in activism per se, but, you know, there's, there's, it's a two way street. The influence between the state, you know, the government and the people's sort of ability to, you know, find the motivation to pray, right? There, There is work being done at the ideological level, right? So that, you know, we don't have to ghettoize one over here and say, well, this is cordoned off completely politics, you know, elections, state government, statecraft, all this sort of stuff. No, like even the idea, like take, take for example, take for example, young girls who believe that, you know, the the Islamic classical scholarly tradition, right, is problematic because it's mostly populated by men. Right. That is a very, very politically formed sensibility to have. And it's something that actually is an obstacle, an Imani obstacle that people have when they kind of fall into this sort of way of thinking. And there's there are what's that based off of? That's based off of certain ideas about how power works that are completely inimical to our tradition that believe that you can only represent justly your identity group, right? And you have no ability to speak for, let alone care for, or tend to, or take care of anybody outside of your identity group, which is completely false, right? So there are some sort of things that are politically political, even though we're not used to thinking of them as political. Yeah, yeah. And they shape people's ability to, yeah, develop motivation to, to want to pray. How do they feel towards Islam? Do they feel that Islam is like, oh my gosh, this you know, it's just my culture or it's what my parents do or it's what I'm forced to do or if, what, like, those are the things that, because I agree with you in principle. I agree. I do not. And I'm very careful about um, the audience that I'm speaking to. And I'm not talking about, you know, like very overtly what most people think of as political, you know, on the minbar every, every Friday. But I do try to address like the, the, the doubts beneath the surface that are in some sense political that make it hard for people to appreciate the Sharia. That make it hard for people to actually, you know, alhamdulillah, this last World Cup, we saw how many people like love the ummah, how much love of the ummah uh, and solidarity with the ummah is alive. But there are some people where that's dead. There's some people in our ummah where the, the solidarity and the love for each other is dead and the love for the sharia is dead. They think that, you know, whatever we have now is the best system is, you know, progress and enlightenment and all that. 
right? So, so addressing those things, I do think is an appropriate thing that actually is going to unlock potential for even average people. And I don't think anybody would disagree. And I believe I'm doing mm -hmm. that the ways I'm doing it. I'm, I don't consider it political in the classical sense. You're right. It's political mm -hmm. in the modern sense. But to me, these are nawazir of aqidah. These are modern issues that we have to discuss. And I do this all the time in my own way. And I'm sure, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, uh, Ustad Uthman does it as well. So I think we're all in agreement here in this regard. Let's move on to, I think, one point that I, um, I would like to hear your thoughts on. My third point. I feel that... Um, these parties and movements have unfortunately not given us a viable worked out mechanism of what exactly it would mean if we were to give them a chance at power. I don't know. What do you guys think about this? I agree 100%. And I think that there's a, a very, very telltale reason why, because almost no quote unquote Islamist political movement for the last hundred years has seriously critiqued modernity or the modern state at all. They've basically attempted to take modern power, the modern state, and just slap Islamic sort of rules or Sharia laws on top of it. And I don't think that can possibly work. I think that the nation of yeah, one hundred percent. No, I think that the decentral exactly what I laid out in my in my initial sort of thing. I think that you can't do it without decentralized sort of ulama that are economically and politically independent. Uh, you can't do it with the type of modern disciplinary power where you're up in people's lives and you're reshaping their subjectivities in the super invasive way, income taxes, all these sorts of things, like you said. I don't think that's going to work. And I don't think that uh, I think that we need to th I think that the movements that have to come about have to think uh, rethink things on a much more fundamental level mm -hmm. than the other political movements have done up until this point. Exactly. Sheikh Uthman, your comments on this. Yeah, I've been one, I've been spent many years in one of these uh, uh, movements. So I should have something to say. Um, <laughs> I, I agree, but I also disagree a little bit. Um, more important than that, perhaps I'm not sure this rubric or the criteria here or the assumption behind the question is on the is on the mark. Uh, what I mean by that is, regardless of what the Islamist parties have done or not done, um, the, the, the obligation is not on them. The obligation is on the ummah. So if someone tried it and did it wrong, did it badly, let's say, uh, for argument's sake, we have a greater responsibility to do it right uh, instead of Connor's. Otherwise, what's like what's the implication? They got it wrong, so therefore it must not be possible. The other thing I would say also is I think we need an important um, control mechanism here, uh, control sort of thought in this uh, in this thought experiment. If you think about the other, let's look at the other movements who are focused on tarbiya and tasfiya and, and 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 that type of a approach to the revival of the ummah. They should also be uh, critically assessed as to where they've come. What, what I keep hearing is. And some of these have been around for 70, 80 years, some 50, some 60, some 40. Uh, and every decade that I've been around for, I've been around for three now at least, every time I speak to someone, they tell me that the Muslims aren't ready, the, the, the Ummah is far from Islam. I'm thinking they're going, bro, you've been here for 70 years, so what are you doing? <laughs> you know what I mean? To put it in a sort of pithy way, but um, I think that control aspect is very important so that we don't sort of uh, uh, selectively take the wrong implication. Coming to the question itself, I think that the movements have given us, they've done a lot of good work, but they have not, uh, uh, they've not hit the mark. They've, they've fallen short in significant ways for a number of reasons. One of, I agree with Imam Tom, that uh, there's a, there's a, um, an allergy perhaps, I don't know, um, a wrong understanding uh, epistemically of, of how we need to engage foreign traditions. Um, and so it's like, West equals kuffar equals intellectual knowledge is all wrong. We don't need to pay attention. We just need to study it when we need to refute it. And I think that's a that's an incorrect attitude, both in our tradition classically, but uh, also today, ever the more so, knowledge production has come out of the West, whether we like it or not. We don't like it. But the last 300 years, that's where it's been. We have not done anything of, of much significance. You know? And that's a, that's a function of who's at the center of power. So anyway, there's a few thoughts there, but I think we need to keep uh, on both. We need to keep this a, a sort of a fair assessment across the board. I mean, Jay, what what would an Islamic nation state look like in the modern world? You know, we've all read a while, we've all, uh, I don't know if you read Andrew March as well, another great person tweeted in this regard. I mean, there's just, 
and and we saw this even when the yani, the brotherhood was running in Egypt, right? When issues are you going to start jizya? Ah, well, okay, we're going to have to. Or is, can a Christian be a, the the president? Like, how can you have a nation state in which everybody is supposed to be equal under the nation, right? And then you have the laws of of, of Islam. And then how can a nation state be a type of khilafa when that would mean anybody in the world can just walk in and acquire citizenship. We're talking about a billion and a half people, not just one small ethnicity of a few million that might be able to do that somewhere in the Middle East. We're talking about the Muslim Ummah. I mean, and again, over and over again, I've spoken to a lot of these people and asked them very specific questions. I'd rather not publicize here, but very specific. And they can't give me a straight answer because they haven't thought about these things because it's just a matter of if we have a Khilafah, everything will be solved. Bro, think 10 steps ahead. We had a Khilafah for 14 centuries and under it, there was good and bad. It's not as if there was never any evil there. Under it, we lost, you know, Andalus, we lost, yani, you know, uh, Palestine and we got it in spite of the Khilafah. I mean, I've said this all in my khatiras and whatnot. So my humble suggestion to those that are so interested in that field, go to the books and write thought papers. Give us, you know, uh, scenarios. Give us uh, uh, conceptual ideas of how this country would work and have discussions and learn from the mistakes of 10 years ago when you were given power, you know, and you couldn't even hold it for what, a year and a half because you didn't have the infrastructure. You didn't have the independence, you know, superpowers far more powerful than you were playing you as pawns in a very vicious game. You were simply not politically savvy enough in this regard. So Allah Musta'an, yani, it pains me because our hearts were with those people, you know, our hearts were with those people. But in any khair, um, I want to bring up two, three things before we um, go back. And um, both of you brought up the issue of Inni Ja'al Radi Khalifa. Uh, just for the record, um, I'm not so sure that I would agree with that interpretation. I think you're both aware that this is a very contested interpretation. And in fact, Ibn Taymiyyah, uh, was not too happy with this interpretation that Khalifa means political authority in the Ja'far Khalifa. And so, uh, in fact, a number of um, uh, authorities said that one should not understand it that way. Or even if it is, then it is subjective to the prophets, for example, you know, um, and whatnot. Ya Dawudu inna ja'anaka khalifa fil ardi, for example, right? So there is a classical, pre modern, nothing to do with state and initiative. There is a classical controversy about the meaning of inni ja'afir al khalifa. So that should be uh, pointed out. Also, the verse, uh, nas, again, um, the way that I see it, these types of verses indicate, and the most explicit one is Surah An Nur, Alladina immakkanahum fil ardi. If you have power, you must do all of this. But I go back to my initial point that should minorities, especially minorities, make this a priority amongst themselves? Yes, generic fard kifaya for the ummah, we're all in agreement. But us living here in Western lands, and we are not people of double standards. I want to say this very clearly. We don't have a secret agenda and a public agenda. That's not who we are. We don't have private meetings, you know, amongst ourselves. And then we say something to the public. So brutally honest question. If minorities in America or England or France, you know, 10, 15%, 20% Muslim in Paris, right? If they were told or they started to speak amongst themselves, a part of our agenda, a part of our, you know, shari'i hukuq, and Allah wants us to do this, is to establish our version of laws. Uh, in the society we live in. What would be the repercussions? Is this something the Sharia wants to have? Or is it better for us minorities to simply fight for our legal rights to be Muslim and to preserve that which shall um, uh, allow us to enter Jannah, our salvational uh, uh, um, uh, level of Jannah, right? Um, what we need to do to enter Jannah, our salvational level is, is good enough, right? What we need to do to enter Jannah, we can do in a secular state. It's not good to be in an immoral state that we are in. It's not good to be in this hedonistic area. But within this land, we are able to carve out enough ibadat and rituals and good and khair and da'wah that insha'Allah ta'ala will get us into Jannah. The flip, is, uh, the, 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 the flip side is not the case. We can have an ideal Muslim land and within it, we're not necessarily going to be doing stuff to enter Jannah. And more importantly, as minorities... Are we going to make this a part of our agenda that we want to influence society? You're talking about different types of power, any type of power. Is it our long-term explicit goal that we want to enforce our laws on the rest of society? 
If that is the case, what are going to be the repercussions of the minorities living here? We need to think these things through because we are not double-faced. We don't plot and secret. You know, uh, this is not uh, a part of our methodology that we go into secret and have cabals and then we say something in public. So for the record, I don't think it is a part of our sharia uh, to, as minorities, I'm speaking for minority. I'm not speaking Muslim majority, as minorities to have this on our agenda. Rather, our clear-cut agenda is to influence the hearts and minds of the people to embrace Islam. And if they decide later on, mashallah, they want to do a thing, good for them. But the explicit agenda, we live Islam. We preach Islam. We preserve Islam. That is the explicit agenda. Wallahu alam. If I can come here, I think this is probably, uh, this is good because I think this is coming to maybe the core disagreement. Um, or, or, or I should say you, you you put out there three or four different points, but the, I think it was the third one about um, what's, what's requisite to get to Jannah. Um, in contrast with what's not. That's where probably I would disagree um, quite firmly. Uh, I think it, it this idea is undergirded by what uh, technically I'd refer to as a atomistic social ontology. What that means is uh, a certain understanding of society where your base units are individuals. And so you're saying, okay, what, what does this individual need to get to Jannah? Well, if it ticks salah, so the, the fardain, if it ticks all the fardain boxes, uh, in theory, of course, Allah decides who gets to Jannah, but from what we know, uh, he's, he's, he or she has done what was required. The problem with that is, if you affirm that logic, uh, apart from the what I would argue is a flawed social ontology, but if you affirm that logic, the same can and must for consistency be said about every other fad kifayah. So, if I raise, again, this is where I think the, the comparison is always important, where we deprioritize something, but we're prioritizing another thing of a similar level. Let's talk about uh, ta'lim. Not not learning, not me learning uh, what I need to fill my ahkam, which is fardain, but me now going out to teach hadith and usul and fiqh. The madaris, the universities, the Islamic universities. Fard kifaya. No one ever says they're fardain. Right? They're fard kifaya. So now I can say, okay, well, Muhammad and Fatima and Khalid and Zaid, do they really have to get involved in this? Then I can say, well, that means for 90% of the ummah, we don't need ta'aleem. Okay? And not just that. I use that example because we're all kind of involved in that. But every other fard kifay we dealt with in the same way. So, so in my mind, the problem with this logic is it's disconnecting the farud al kifay from the fard al-ayn. Whereas I think traditionally it goes the opposite way, which is this, that every individual has fard al-ayn, which they have to do, but, the, but they also have to contribute to the farud al kifay. Otherwise, no one does them. And then this is the point. This is why it's different. How is the fard kifayah de de defined? You know, but if no one does it, what happens? Is it only those? It's everyone. Okay. Yeah, there is a qualification of istita and the rest of it, but in principle, everyone's sinful. So, right? so I think let me this, ask you. Let me ask you bluntly then. In your view, no. it is fard kifayah for the Muslims of a minority Western land to aim to establish political dominance in that land? I didn't make that qualification. So I think that's another problem in this in this way of framing the topic, which is to speak of minorities and not of the ummah. I start on the basis of the ummah, and then we can speak about how different the different subsets of the ummah can contribute to that, given their situation. Well, we're, we're in agreement Otherwise, with the Ummah. I, I, there's no disagreement. Fard Kifaya for the Ummah in Muslim majority lands, there's no disagreement. There's a far so, more... So then, but so the, then the level of is, Fard Kifaya is far more when the potential is more, when the imkaniya is more, when the istita'a yeah. is more. And so when you're living in a Muslim land where ideally there should be a lot more people wanting to establish a higher level of morality, a higher level of ethics and laws, right? Your own imkaniya istita'a increases. And therefore, yeah, yeah. your level of fard kifaya also increases, right? Mm -hmm. And my point is, and I'm being very clear here, it is not a fard kifaya for those living in circumstances like our own to aim to make this an implicit or explicit. It could be an aspiration. I'm being very blunt here. I wish everybody converts to Islam, and I wish everybody mm -hmm. wants to live according to Islam. That's an aspiration. 
That's different than we're going to say, this is what we want to do. Because if I am challenged, what do you want? I'm going to say, I want the freedom to be a Muslim. And I'm going to go to court for that freedom. And I'm going to you know, fight for those reasons. If you don't give me that freedom, I'm leaving this land. I'm not going to live in this land if I cannot practice you know, my Islam. That's what I'm going to be fighting for you know, legally and whatnot. But as for this point of... And again, I'm being generic because you understand the sensitivities of wanting to establish a political base, you know, in the lands we live in. I say unequivocally, it is not fard kifaya upon us to do so. Aspiration is different and, and, and fard kifaya is different. Our job here is to help the ummah, no problem. Our job is to aid in a global area, no problem. But where we're living... No, because it is suicide, political suicide for us as minorities to do so. And I always bring up not just yani, the Abyssinian Muslims who clearly had no political aspirations, but frankly, the lived realities of all minorities since the beginning of Islamic history. Wallahu ta'ala Yeah, I agree. Sorry, and I, I think Imam Tom should, should talk first. <clears throat> I, was, I was just oh, actually going to try to clarify what I thought that you were arguing, Dr. Usman, was that um, you're talking, if I understood you, about not necessarily okay maybe far to resurrect something like khilafa but where i think that was the the point maybe dr usman was saying uh maybe the western muslims can contribute to that maybe they can be the the intellectuals maybe they no can problem. be this yeah. the space of free scholarship right where we don't get picked up mm -hmm. and thrown into jail for what we write about right and maybe that's one piece of the puzzle thinking as an ummah that's what our part of the ummah can contribute and who knows where the khilaf is going to to actually be you know established if did i understand you correctly yeah 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 exactly so i wasn't talking about where it would come and obviously this this, so this is the thing there's there's the principles and the method and theory and then you have to work out the strategic and the tactical components which yes. require a lot more effort but i'd like to disagree for another reason um yeah. respectfully of of course, Sheikh Yasser, yeah, sure. um, is that I think that you're understating the urgency that we have to have with how our ability to attain salvation in the current secular space that we live in is being eroded day after day after day. Okay, because um, these things aren't static. Okay, look at now we're 2023. Look at how far we've come in 10 years. Where were we at in 2013? Okay, 2013 was a completely different world when it came to sexuality, when it came to gender, when it came to all these sorts of things. And you know, as I as well as I know, because you're in the masjids, you talk to to real you know Muslims. These are a problem. Like these are problems that the Muslims are having. Are these problems affecting the ability for Muslims to attain to Jannah? Yes, they are. Where are these problems coming from? Okay, lots of places. Yes. But part of it is that the way that the arrangement of the state is set up is that the state takes no strong moral stance on things. Okay, In America, I'll speak specifically for America, we have the political freedom to try to convince other people and to try to, yeah, stump for what we think is the best way. That's my freedom as an American. If you've got the Catholic over here who wants to overturn Roe versus Wade, upon religious grounds even, and you've got the wingnut you know, evangelical that thinks that they're going to build some sort of temple uh, in, in Palestine, I can be, you know, and you've got the Amish who are still riding horses and, and, and carriages. But I can be the Muslim guy. That's, the, that's what I'm no, no. saying. I say that exactly. we need, yes, well, I, well, I'm just trying to draw our attention to the, the, we need to have more urgency in shifting and changing the political order. I do think that's true. I don't think that it means overthrowing anybody. And I don't don't think that it necessarily means, um, you know, as sort of um, crude and confrontational way that, that maybe you suggested. But I, I also don't think that we can just play polite minority and wait around as our actually our, our subjectivities are being changed, our understanding of what Islam is being changed and our ability to attain to Jenna is being changed. Nobody's we have disagreeing a stake. with that. Yeah. Nobody's disagreeing with that. But for the mm -hmm. record, mm -hmm. you have raised a whole different topic, which I would love to have a round two with. And that is our involvement with the political system. I mean, we right. still have people who are saying it's kufar and shirk to get involved. We still have people who right. don't understand what it means to be involved in, in, in the political field, which means you're going right. to have to compromise uh, on the lesser good in order to repel the, you know, the greater good. Right. Mm -hmm. And here's the problem that comes. Assessments of greater and lesser goods vary from group to community and person to person. And so if you're going to want to fight this particular cause, this moral marriage issue, for example, you're mm -hmm. going to have to overlook other issues that are problematic in order to fight this battle, right? And, you know, perhaps a time will come 
And dare I say, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, there was that time where there was the notion that our civil rights are being eroded as Muslims in this land. And so for that time frame, if we were to fight that battle and ignore other battles, right, because we now have an actual existential threat of legitimate legislation. You remember 22 states attempting to pass laws that are very clearly uh, demarcating our civil liberties. So this becomes a different issue altogether, when to fight what battle. But I do think, Sheikhana, that we're all in agreement here that we are not, you know, apolitical pacifists. We are activists in our role to protect our identities. But that is different than the claim that our ultimate goal is to rule over the land. That is different than that claim. Because we are protecting our identity. This is encroaching in our identity, right? So, for example, why are we not uh, uh, trying to ban alcohol? That is Ummul Khaba'ith. And it is one of the biggest cause of car accidents and like liver cancer, et cetera, et cetera. Who amongst us is coming together? There's probably still some groups that are trying to resurrect the 19th Amendment. We could. We could. And, and that's, would that's that the whole thing. Would that Maybe be wise? Would that be wise? Maybe it would. Why not? Right? That's, that's the sort All of thing. The it's like, I, like, Go for it. I, I, I believe, you know, and this is like, again, like I can't speak for the political situation in Australia, but in America, you know, you get to let your freak flag fly. And there is no minority that's, uh, excuse me, there is no majority that is a solid majority. You actually have a plurality of different types of minorities that believe wildly different things. And they each get to theoretically participate in this society where they get okay. to either convince okay. or maneuver or so I'm just saying it's like, let's make sure, and I'm not saying you're not saying this, but I want to emphasize if that's the game, then let's play the game. If we have okay, a, if a we have an idea of what ideal society is like and other religious groups have their ideas of what ideal society is like, why don't we also get to play politics and maneuver to establish our ideal society? Because it's not a game. Time, money, experience, <laughs> energy is spent. That's why. Because our resources are limited. As a Muslim community in America, we have limited people already in the game. We have limited time and bandwidth. So it's not just playing Monopoly that we just spend an hour. You are going to spend precious resources doing chasing a wild goose. At this stage of the American game, alcohol is not going to be banned. We in America are less than 1%. So for us to get involved in this, it's fun. It's you think it's da'wah good for you. Maybe there is some da'wah. And I'm not saying what you're doing is wrong. Good for you. But is that what the community needs to do, even in the political front? This is where I think we need to be a little bit I more think, wise. I think there might be a, I think there might be a middle ground here, um, which is that which also ties back to our, our essential difference, perhaps, that um there's a difference between an intellectual work that confronts alcohol. And a political work that tries to ban alcohol. Precisely. Yes. I think 100%. we all. I think we all. I think we all agree on the first part. However, I think there may be a disagreement because, for some of us, that intellectual work stops at a certain point, whereas for others, I think it goes on. So for me, I would focus on alcohol as part of a certain way of life that we need to confront intellectually because we have a different way of life that we believe is better. That's Dawa. But I don't think there's no cap, there's no limit on this. This for me then connects with. Uh, because the way of life is secular liberal, right? Secularism, liberalism, capitalism, uh, intellectually and politically. So, but not to overthrow or change, but I want to create that discourse to say we've got something better, okay? And this ties into the last question about what the minorities in the West should be doing. That is the same discourse we need in the Muslim world because the secular liberal capitalist framework is hegemonic the world over. Okay, so our contribution then is to further that discourse all over the world. And when we talk about Imkaniya, I agree with Shaykh Yasser, your point from an Usuli perspective, but Imkaniya, it's not a, it's not that there are different aspects to it. There are certain aspects in which we have greater possibilities in the West, greater resources, greater freedom than people in Syria and Egypt and Pakistan. Right. So this is why I start on the basis of the Ummah, we think as an Ummah, and then I decide, okay, what, and obviously the default would be to work for governance in the Muslim world, not in the West. But we can all contribute to, to that. Where I see a difference is, particularly when you bring up examples like Abyssinia, because I agree, in Abyssinia, the Muslims were not, there was nothing political at all. No plan, no connection, no nothing. They were there temporarily. But the difference is that's because they had something, which was the asl in Mecca, going on, to which they were an exception. The problem I have with people who bring up Abyssinia a lot, uh, as an example, is they don't have the asl. There's no asl and it's just Abyssinia. 
right? Yeah. Or, or it's Abyss or we become Abyssinia in Australia, the US, and there is an assumption that if there's going to be a Mecca, it's somewhere in the Muslim, but we don't know about that. Could happen. Maybe it's having to be. Not, that's that's I think then becomes a little frivolous in terms of a, a, a genuine assessment of what was going on in the Sira. We need the Mecca for Abyssinia to make sense. Otherwise, Abyssinia is an excuse for us not to get involved. So, and as you're aware as well, this is a very big uh, usuli debate of the Sira that to what level do we read in status quo as being the causes of what's going on? And there have been interpretations, and I've read this myself, that uh, the Prophet ﷺ kept Abyssinia as a backup plan. That's why he kept Jaffa there until the seventh year of the Hijrah, right? Mm -hmm. Because, and again, this is an analysis, this is one reading of the Sirah where the reason why the Prophet ﷺ went to Medina for political power is because he wasn't given the freedom to worship Allah and to practice the rituals. Had he been given the freedom, would he have then wanted political power? Or would he have been content simply fulfilling the arkan without persecution? And a number of authorities have opined, and it's an opinion, and Allahu A'lam, because in the end of the day, both sides are, are, are basing it on assumptions, that if Medina were to, because uh, Badr, Uhud, Ahzab, I mean, Ahzab was existential for a month. They didn't know whether they'd make it or not, right? So what if there was a backup plan for the Muslims to have a place to at least worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and migrate to. This is a theory that has been mentioned by, not me, people before me. You find it in the earlier uh, uh, shuruh of the uh, Sira books. So this notion of trying to mirror exactly Abyssinia is like this, Makkah is like this, Medina like this, I find that a little bit simplistic. Rather, I find it, it is completely legit to look at overall the paradigms. It is permissible for Muslims to live as a minority when the alternative is persecution. And they may live there and persevere their faith. It's not ideal. The ideal is Medina. Every We all agree on this, right? Given the current world we live in, there is no Medina. And the majority of Muslim countries are dictatorships where me and you would be in jail right now. And you know that. We would be being tortured right now because of our stances that we have against those regimes and whatnot. We know this. And we thank Allah that in the lands we live in, we have the right to worship and to preach and to teach with ultimate freedom. So let us work on preserving these rights for ourselves and our children. And let us work on influencing as much as we can without uh, yeah, jeopardizing those rights in an unwise manner. And this is, again, my life and my work so far has been indicative of this. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Yeah, I think uh, that's a good, it's a good summary, perhaps also of the agreement and the disagreement. Uh, Medina is the ideal, but I think there has to be um, always and at every point an attempt by the Ummah to work towards Medina. I'm saying to yeah, go think, for it. <laughs> so I think it goes back really, go back to the, that, the whole discussion about the priority and whatnot, but uh, I think we've covered that. Uh, Alhamdulillah. Inshallah. Uh, so maybe we have concluding thoughts and then we can wrap up. Bismillah. Okay. Um, Bismillah. Ustad Tom, you go first. I would say, oh boy. Um, concluding thoughts. I do think that at the most fundamental level, you know, Islam has so much to contribute to the space wherever you are. Okay. And I hesitate and I'm wary of um <clears throat> simply the 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 call to simply uh coexist and just simply preach and just simply work on on Tezkiyah because i think as i said before i think it understates first of all it's a most opportunity because islam actually has a lot to again contribute and offer and show people a better way when it comes to how to organize society family life etc cetera, etc cetera. um and we're talking about persuasion we're talking about you know convincing people and and demonstrating and things like that um, but we can't underestimate, uh, we can't underestimate the, the ways in which, um, how things are going right now might actually be the end of our freedom to preach. Where is the, where is our freedom coming from? Is our freedom coming from the secular liberal order? Maybe it is, but maybe if the secular liberal order is being taken to its utmost conclusion, Right. And there's certain people in the United States that would like to define certain things within Islam as hate speech. Right. And maybe that's another conclusion of it. Right. So I, I feel an urgency. I feel an urgency to 
um, to carve out a space actively and not passively, right? To make sure that um, we know that having some moral sort of worldview is something that is going to be respected, is something that is going to be able to be heard uh, in our society. And also, yes, like trying to convince and 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 the last point, and I and we reference this as well. I do think that people sell the West short, and I think that one of the ways that Western Muslims can contribute to the Ummah is being that space of intellectual power, where we have uh, we have the freedoms that other people don't have. We have institute. We we're, we have the ability to make waqfs. We have the ability to make institutions. We have the ability to to say what we want and research what we want. Why aren't we taking advantage of it and putting it to the to the service of the ummah? I think that's a very very important project going forward. Zakallah khair. Zakutman. Barakallah fiqum. I think we I think we occupy a very important historical moment uh, in which there's a need to fairly and automatically, if I can, assess where we're at. I think it's fair to say, as we've said today, that. Uh, the Islamist movements, for one of a better category, um, whilst having contributed a lot, I don't want to deny that, have come to a, a wall or a dead end and have in many of the important respects of what they went out to do have failed. But I would add, so have the apolitical movements that focused only on Tarbiya and Tasfiya. So we're in an automatic moment in that sense. We have to come together and go, this is what we achieved and this is what we failed. What can we do? And I think these type of conversations are are, uh, are the type that we need. And I'd like to um, thank uh, Dr. and Sheikh Yasser for this because he invited us to, to have this discussion. And I think we need more of these. On the topic itself, very briefly, I'd say that um, I still think that the political approach is, is part and parcel of Islam. I'll go back to the quotes of the scholars, Sheikh al-Islam, you know, there is no establishment of the deen without the governance aspect. Um, I think the critical failing in the uh, preaching only or the tarbiyah only approach uh, with limited political commentary is that it fails to, or it's, it almost assumes that we operate in a vacuum. We don't. Uh, if you're not going to be at the center of power or addressing the center of power, it will be addressing you. It will be playing you. That's why I think we're, we're in this cycle always of trying to uh, rectify the Islam of the Ummah, but the Ummah's Islam is always problematic um, decade after decade, as I said. So I think we need to think about that. Uh, I think we agree on a lot, which is a mm. wonderful point to start on. If there's a disagreement, it is on, on that priority. I think the priority is, is extremely high. It's urgent. We didn't even start to talk about you know the crisis points in the ummah which cannot begin to be addressed without something of this nature but i i look forward to more of these uh these conversations mashallah alhamdulillah so again alhamdulillah too i think we are all in agreement actually listening to all of this i think our agreements are far more than the disagreements i think even if we're wording it slightly differently all three of us are clearly wanting to change hearts and minds as many possible levels in the lands we live in. We want to demonstrate the superiority of uh, uh, Allah's wisdom, uh, the Sharia, the laws of Islam to the people around us in a way that will be convincing to them and in a way that is going to protect our rights as well. That much we are all clear upon. We're also in agreement that we have certain perks and privileges in these lands that many of our brothers and sisters in other lands don't, and we should utilize those for their services. We should utilize those to help them uh, in uh, bringing about a, a better society, a more moral society in whatever way that is possible. I think these two points are key in our points of agreement, alhamdulillah. Um, one of the main reasons why I wanted to convene all of us together really is to demonstrate that inshallah ta'ala, you know, all of us were, might might be on a slightly different spectrum, but where there's genuine inshallah ukhuwa and brotherhood, and we know we are all wanting to do good for the ummah in our own ways. And we're all learning from one another. I mean, was, you know, uh, you know, Ustad Tom, you know, I've spoken with you many times and, you know, with Ustad Uthman as well. We've had so many conversations back and forth. Some of them a little bit heated, but in the end of the day, that's why we're here is that we want to demonstrate that our ukhuwa is more important and what unites us is far, far more than the, frankly, 
this is just the spectrum of differences because really there's no substantive difference. Think about it. You know, there's no substantive difference. We want to see, you know, the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, reign supreme. We want to see izzah for this ummah. We want to see uh, the tatbiq of uh, the Quran, you know, in some place in the world. That's something that we're all in agreement on. And alhamdulillah, it's just a matter of what is the best way? What is the priority? What is the methodology? And inshallah, there's going to be, you know, some diversity of thought here. But <laughs> excuse me, Zakmullah khair to the both of you. Anyway, and I'd like to invite you again for a future one, inshallah, maybe about, um, I don't know, what's the topic you guys have in mind? Be my guest, oh, Dr. Uthman, I don't know. <laughs> There's quite a few topics I think that come out of There's this. A lot. We can choose, choose number of them, method, form, vision. How um, about political engagement in, engagement in the West? Yeah, yeah. Khair, let's That's... talk about this in our WhatsApp, inshallah, but... yeah. Thank you both. Jazakumullahu khairan. Um, I'm just going to, inshallah, um, uh, we will, inshallah, continue conversation. But thank you very much. I know it's uh, late for you, Stad Tom. It's a bit uh, early for you. Uh, but inshallah ta'ala, we will have another uh, session in this, inshallah. Jazakumullahu khair. <laughs> أما استحييته تعصيني ولا تخشى من العتب وتخفي الذنب عن خلقي وتأبى في الهوى قربي فتب مما جنيت عسى تعود إلى رضا الرب تعود إلى رضا الرب Thank you.